Hey, this is Jeff, and I'm the pastor of Blumkiss Baptist Church. And this is going to be our last Sunday of being exclusively online. So what this means is Sunday the 24th, we will be live and in person. But simultaneously, we're going to be doing our Zoom church. So we'll be broadcasting. Hopefully it works out. We're still going to pre-record messages just like this one. But 10.30 a.m., over at Blumkist Baptist Church on Main Street in Blumkist. We're the only church in Blumkist. Uh, if you go somewhere else and you find a church, you're in Svea. So uh, we hope you can join us 1030, Sunday the 24th. We're going to wear masks. We're going to be spread out and we're going to worship together. Um, and if you want to stay home and catch us live, there's still that Zoom streaming option. So we're going to do the best we can with what we have. If there's any technical difficulties, we always have the pre-recorded version. So that starts Sunday, the 24th. We're excited to be back together. And uh, yeah, just keep us in your prayers. And thank you for joining us. All right, so we're going to ring a bell that I've been trying to sound for the past few weeks, or at least some of the past few weeks, and I want us to look at Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. I know we've gone through it together as a church before. Uh, we did a series on Ephesians a couple years ago, like three years ago, and uh, the reason why I want to hit on this is because Paul is writing to a church that is claiming Christ in order to remind them of Christ's promises to them despite a culture that is inviting their eyes to look elsewhere. Uh, not much changes over 2,000 years, does it? Um, so Paul's writing to a church at a specific time, but some things God has for his people are evergreen. So let's look at Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10 right now. May God bless the reading of his word. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. All right, so here's a few reasons why I wanted to go through this passage today. Uh, last week, we talked a lot about humility. Um, I want to keep ringing that bell because I think I think a large part of the Christian walk, a large part of following Jesus is just laying our, it's like the only part, laying our lives down so that we can have his, um, so that he can truly give us life, not trying to create our own lives, but receiving the life he's given us. And so as we just went through Acts, touching on the planting of multiple churches, Paul spent a considerable amount of time in Ephesus and he cares about these people and he's following up with them while imprisoned in Rome. So this book was probably written about 62 AD, sent out uh, by delivery by one of Paul's friends, uh, would have been hand delivered. He would have got, they would have had a few people that would have brought letters to other, other churches to check in on them. And what we have happening here is Paul going, I care about you guys. I want us to be on the same page and I want us to love Jesus. I want us to understand the miracle of what happened when Jesus conquered the grave after taking the cross. So church, I want us to understand on some level, on a greater level, how much love he has for us. So let's look at this. This is a message of Christ reconciling creation back to himself and God through the cross and, and the Holy Spirit 
bringing his creation back to the creator and, and that the church is for the whole world and for anyone, any nationality, any economic class, anyone, anyone to be united with each other and united with Christ. So Ephesians uh, is going to highlight the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to see that throughout the book of Ephesians. We covered that three years ago when we did this series. But this speaks to us about the grace of God at work in our lives and those he's called. He's calling us all. And, and this is the work of grace and faith in our lives. This letter calls us to faith. This letter calls us to respond from the base of Christ's love for us. That's our foundation. There's a power there that's worth more than any, any of the temptations that society can offer us. So Ephesus would have had a lot of temptations. Well, we're in America. We have a lot of temptations too. The good news for us is that there's a victory only Christ can bring. The challenging thing for us is there's a victory only Christ can bring. All right. So when we try to find victory in other places, they're temporary at best and probably detrimental at worst. So there's a leadership that only Christ can fulfill. There's a question that only Christ can answer. So my question to you, where do you find your hope? And, and the answer, church, I know what most of you guys are going to say. It's going to be Jesus. But functionally, I want us to explore that. So before we look at these 10 verses again, I want us to remember a quick exchange that Paul has while he's on trial in chapter 26 of the, six of the book of Acts. So about two months ago, we would have covered this. Um, in verse 8 of chapter 26 uh, of Acts, Paul is starting his opening statements in front of King Agrippa, and he asks this question. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Now, right before that, Paul had gone a little bit through the history of the prophets and, and kind of laid the groundwork. And his audience would have been some very important people in Roman culture, but also Pharisees. So he's addressing Pharisees and Sadducees and going, why would anyone, like we have the prophets, why would anyone be surprised that God raises the the dead. And 2,000 years later, it's easy to look back on hindsight because we have an empty tomb and a resurrected Jesus and we have all this history pointing towards this. But Paul, I know why. <laughs> dead people don't typically come back to life, man. But Paul knows that they can and that they will and that the only way that is possible is through a faith in and the following of Jesus Christ. So Paul knows that Jesus can save from a physical death, but even more importantly, from a spiritual death. And Paul brings, Paul brings this to the forefront, that Jesus brings life. In one of our Advent messages, we talked about John's introduction that says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That's our king. That's Jesus. So Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus about the transformation that they've already experienced. He's reminding them of their true love. He's reminding them of how miraculous that is. Church, <laughs> this is going to be a terrible aside, but it's the best I could do uh, under the circumstances. So I, I love the movies in the franchise, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Parks, Jurassic World, whatever even the ones that weren't that good. I just, I just love them. So Jurassic Park came out at least 25 years ago, right? When Jurassic World came out, it poked at the audience's boredom with dinosaurs, both at the fictional park on the screen, but also to the audience in the theater. Uh, the main, one of the main characters, Claire, goes, we've been pre-booking tickets for months. The park needs a new attraction every few years to reinvigorate the public's interest, kind of like the space program. Corporate felt genetic modification would up the wow factor, to which Owen replies, they're dinosaurs. Wow enough. And I think this exchange can speak to the church, even though it's just a stupid dinosaur movie. <laughs> Have we lost the wow factor of what Jesus has given us through the riches of his mercies and the miracle of his grace? Have we gotten bored with that? Have we really gotten bored with that? That should be wow enough. Have we really become numb to being brought from death into life? 
Have, has that numbed us? Have we gotten numb to the forgiveness we've received through the cross of Christ? Have we gotten numb to that so, so much so that we don't extend it to others? Our sin, our mess, and our transgressions, they made us dead to the reality of the promises of God. But the promise of Jesus and the faithfulness of God to supply a way back to right standing with him makes us alive again. And that should amaze us. We should not lose the wow factor there. It should amaze us all the time. It doesn't mean we won't have bad moments or bad days or, or tough or, or just like be persecuted or even, man, just not have things go your way. At the same time, it should also make us really grateful and humble when we interact with each other and especially those who don't believe in the same things that we do. Why? Well, here's why. All of us were no better at some point. Paul points this out. All of us, pre-Jesus, were a mess. Even post-Jesus, <laughs> we're kind of messy. But we're a mess with hope. We're a mess that's loved. We're a mess that is saved. We're a mess that should be growing. And we're a mess that's delighted in. And we can be secure in our imperfections and not getting it right all the time because we can always run back to the Father because of the work of the Son. So as we look into this, Paul points this out, that we don't have to be perfect because we're not. Our nature is imperfect, but we're made to be good. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I was spiritually bankrupt and bouncing checks all right i deserved what i deserved but god is rich in mercy and he covers the tab through his son jesus christ i was dead to god jesus makes me alive to god when i wasn't figuring it all out and i still i mean i still haven't it wasn't when i had it all figured out that god said yeah you're welcome in what happened when he said you're welcome in is when i fell in love it's when i acknowledged that i was not the solution to my own problems my sin problems my pain my suffering my myself and in this passage paul points out that god is kind to us he, he echoes that multiple times he points out that he loves us i think sometimes those dynamics, like we generically, and I know we've talked about this before, but we generically understand that God loves us, like corporate us, but I think we struggle with him liking us. Like he does like he doesn't like me. I know me. I'm a pain in the butt. Like I know me. I'm I'm a problem child. But he likes us and he loves us. And the cross is proof of that. And it's not based on who we are. It's based on whose we are. It's not based on how good we are. It's based on how good he is. And I'm not that delightful all the time, but he delights in me. <laughs> and he's delighted to give his son to bring me home. Personalize that. It's corporate, but it's personal. It's, it's not just a private faith. It's a public faith, but it's a personal faith. All right. So it's not based on who we are. It's based on whose we are and who he is. Uh, and so I know we've covered this before, but we need church. We need to be repetitive and we need to get used to pounding this home to our own hearts. We need this pep talk for our hearts. So maybe it hits differently today. Look at verses eight and nine. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You're saved by what? You're saved by grace. Through what? Through faith. And is that from you? No. It's from God. God gives that gift. He gives you the grace and he gives you the faith to believe in that grace. Why? Here's why. The day after Christmas in America is one of the biggest shopping days of the year. <laughs> because that's when we bring back what we got and try to find what we really wanted. And there's nothing better than this gift from God. 
<laughs> God gives us the perfect gift. He gives us communion with him. And it's freely given because if we were just buying it on our own, we would be able to take credit for it. But we can't because it's a gift. God takes our efforts to reach him out of the equation because that would lead to arrogance, which ironically enough, the harder we try, the further we go the wrong direction. It would only lead us away from him. We'd get arrogant and, and self-righteous instead of relying on him to make us holy and good and righteous. And so it's taking it out of our hands, but that doesn't make us passive. We're called to act and respond. Just know what's really happening in this scenario. Verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. It's his creation calling out to the rest of his creation. He's calling us into the Great Commission to testify about the Creator. And that's good. In the past few weeks, in the past few months, may, things have drifted a certain direction. And that's not a political statement. In culture, we've become more divisive. Um, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, the main reason for that is probably me. Start there. Um, how have I helped the situation by surrendering my life to Christ so I can be more Christ-like and truly love my neighbor? And, and with that attitude, church, I think that's how we have to approach this season. This is a great opportunity for the church to show love on, in both what we believe and what we profess, but also to those around us who are skeptical at best, <laughs> cynical at worst, and just why would they want to buy in when, when we're buying into the culture? Uh, so church, remember this. You're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And this is through grace, and this is through faith, and that's not from us. It's a gift from God. Be blessed this week. Love one another and just surrender more of your life to Christ. Lay it down. You will not regret it. God bless.